Hi, I'm Dr. David Adley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about measurement and uncertainty. And this is important for astronomy, but it's also important across scientific disciplines. So basically everything that I'll be talking about today is transferable. So it's important whether you're studying astronomy or physics or chemistry or bio, or even in the social sciences like sociology or economics, uh, because all measurements have inherent uncertainty, and we have to take that into account if we're to treat our data properly. Let's get started. First, let's talk about the three important parts of any measurement. So if we have any real data that we measure in a lab or using a telescope or a survey, any data that we collect using those techniques are going to come with inherent uncertainties and they have to be expressed using the proper units. So if you are reading a scientific paper or if you're reading something in uh, the popular literature, any really good measurement of any scientific data is going to include a value. So that's a number that tells you we attached our experiment to our instrument and the instrument reported a value of 17. But in the absence of any additional information, that number 17 is pretty useless. So we have to connect it to a unit. So if we connect our experiment to a digital multimeter, and so we get an, a result out that says 17 volts. Volts measure what's called electrical potential, and that's important for circuits and a bunch of other things in physics, but that doesn't matter. So we have a number, 17, and a unit, volts. Um, another possible example of this, a really bad example, is if I say I live seven from work because the first thing that should come into your mind is you should say seven what? Do I live seven blocks from work? Do I live seven miles from work? Do I live seven days from work? Do I live seven furlongs from work to pick a weird and obscure unit? So we have to connect an actual unit to that number, the value, or it's useless. And then finally, once I have a measurement with a value and a unit, I also need to know how well I know that number. And that's where my uncertainty comes in. The uncertainty tells me how precisely I know the reported value. So depending on the quality of my digital multimeter, to return to my previous example, that number 17, it could be good to one volt, it could be good to 0.1 volt, it could be good to only 10 volts, so it's actually like 20 plus or minus 10, not 17. So how well our instrument gives us the ability to measure that value, that's what's expressed in uncertainty. Values are relatively easy to understand, um, it's just a number. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to be talking about the other two important parts of a measurement, units and uncertainty. In science, we use the Système International, or SI, system of units. The SI is basically an expanded metric system. So you might be familiar more or less, depending on your, your background, with some parts of the metric system, like meters or temperatures measured in Celsius, or you may even know about temperatures measured in Kelvin if you've had a chemistry class before. And those form the basis of the SI system of units. But the SI system also expands considerably beyond that with specialized units that are important for certain scientific disciplines, and also with what we call derived units or compound units, which are combinations of several base units. For example, the SI measurement of force, called the Newton, is the equivalent of the pound, which you might be more familiar with from the imperial system. The Newton is what we call a compound unit. It's a combination of 
distance, mass, and time in a particular form that's appropriate for how force works. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we work through and talk about Newton's laws and forces and accelerations and all that. But that base system of units, measurements like meters or seconds, need to be extended using a system of prefixes to provide more flexibility. It's a lot more sensible to talk about the distance from, say, I don't know, Aurora to Colorado Springs in Colorado in terms of kilometers than it is in terms of meters, because meters are relatively short. They're good for measuring distances across my house or along a football field, uh, but they're not a great system for measuring distances between cities because cities generally are many thousands of meters apart from one another. So you start to get really big numbers. And these derived units using this system of predefined prefixes allows us to work in the prefix that makes the most sense given the scale of the problem we're talking about. So on the slide here, I've presented a table that contains a few of the most important prefixes that will be relevant as we're studying astronomy. Um, so giga and mega, for example, are going to come in when we start talking about deep time. So the age of the Earth or the age of the universe as a whole might be measured in giga years or multiples of 10 to the 9 years. 10 to the 9, if you're not uh, familiar with uh, that term means one billion years. So 10 to the 9 is a 1 with nine zeros after it, and that is equivalent to 1 billion with a B. A mega year, on the other hand, is a million years. It's 10 to the 6 years. Um, so those are going to be really important when we're talking about geologic and um, cos or geologic history and cosmology. Um, some of the others, things like kilo, which is 10 to the 3 or 1,000, as well as centi and milli, are going to be much more common use in everyday environments. Um, so centimeters, millimeters are things that show up on a ruler if you've got a metric ruler. And then finally, nano is 10 to the minus 9 or 1 1 billionth. Um, and nanometers are commonly used to measure the wavelengths of light. Um, so this being astronomy, we have to deal with light quite a bit. Um, and visible light exists in the range of a few hundred nanometers for its wavelength. And if that didn't make a whole lot of sense to you, don't worry. We'll spend time talking about light and how light works and how we understand it. Um, but for now, as we're starting out and looking at the basics, Knowing that we have these prefixes and knowing where to go to find them and look them up can be really useful. Take a minute now, pause the video, and try to answer these two example questions. I mean, and they're designed to be relatively simple, so try converting 60 centimeters to a measurement in meters, and then convert 3.2 kilometers to a measurement in centimeters. So go ahead and pause the video, work through that. You might take a couple of minutes. If you need to, you can always go back and go back to that table on the previous slide. Um, so go ahead, I'll wait. Are you finished? Okay, so here's the answers. 60 centimeters is equivalent to 0 0.6 meters and 3.2 kilometers is equivalent to 3,200 meters, which is equal to 3.2 times 10 to the 5 centimeters, or if you wrote that out in standard notation, that's 320,000 centimeters. Um, this is where scientific notation starts to get useful, but that's a different video. All right. That's it for units, and let's finish now in the last couple of minutes talking about measurement uncertainty. So how imperfect is our value that we recorded in our lab or at our telescope? 
when we make a measurement and when we report it, it's going to look like the example you see on the middle left of the slide. So we might measure the length of a marker and find that it's 3.10 plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters. So we've got initially our value and then our uncertainty followed by a unit. You might mix up where the units go. So if the uncertainty is much, much smaller than the measurement, you might provide separate units for the value and the uncertainty. But generally speaking, when we report a value, it's going to look basically like what I've written in the middle of the slide there. When we do calculations, and this is an advanced topic that's not going to be too important for us, but can be relevant in a lot of other places. Um, so if you're taking other science classes, for example, you might need to take the uncertainty on an individual measurement and then propagate that forward to figure out the uncertainty on a result of a calculation that you do using that measurement. Um, and I'll show you an example of how this can look in a minute using graphs. First, let's talk about how we actually graph those measurements that I showed you on the previous slide. So if you have a value and a unit and an uncertainty, we can put that on some graphic axes, but we need to have a way of showing both the value and the range of allowed values given the measurement uncertainty. And we do that by using a point, so a circle or a diamond or an asterisk or whatever your chosen data point is to represent the value that was measured. And then we use what are called error bars to represent the allowed range of values. Um, so depending on your discipline, there are slightly different conventions for whether the error bars should be one times the uncertainty or two times or three times. Um, and that gets into all sorts of advanced statistics um, that are not relevant for us. But generally speaking, when you have an uncertain measurement and you graph it, it will look like what you see on the right-hand side of the slide. You'll have a dot representing a value and then bars representing the allowed range around that value. Let's look at how that looks on an actual graph with real data. So this is a measurement of current versus electrical potential, um, returning to our volts again. And this has been measured in a lab. So there are actual potentials and currents, and they have some uncertainties. That's what those vertical and horizontal bars are showing. And then if we want to connect current and electrical potential, it turns out that you do that using electrical resistance. Um, and you can use these data to figure out the resistance in that circuit. Uh, that's that best fit line that you see running from the lower right to the, or lower left, excuse me, to the upper right, because I know my left and my right. Um, and that's what's labeled best. But because there are uncertainties in the measurements, not all of the measurements lie along that best fit line. And so there's some possible range. The actual resistance in the circuit might be a little bit more or a little bit less than the best fit value. And so we have a max and a min curve that represent the allowed range of that thing that we call resistance, given our data. So when we make measurements, they always contain a measurement, a unit, and an uncertainty. And the uncertainty can have really important impacts on how much we can learn from our data and how strong the conclusions that we draw can be. Finally, let's talk about how we report measurements. When we write down a number, oftentimes, the number that comes out of our instrument, our digital multimeter or gas spectrometer or whatever, is going to be much, much longer than is relevant given the precision of that measurement. Um, so we're going to get many more digits out of our instrument than are actually useful scientifically because the error limits the value that we can place 
on the least significant digits. So if you get a really long number out of your instrument, but then you have a relatively high measurement uncertainty, like the example that you see in the middle of the slide there, most of the digits that are written in that value are not significant. So we're going to leave those off. So properly expressed, we're only going to go as far as the most significant digit in our measurement uncertainty. So that number, 2.8684792, plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters, most of the digits in that value aren't important. So I'm going to leave those off, and I'm going to round that value so that I only go as far as the size of the measurement uncertainty. So I'm going to round that initial value to 2.87 plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters. And when I do that, I have not lost any information because all of those extra digits beyond that um, 2.87, they're so much smaller than my measurement uncertainty that they're meaningless. So it's important to be able to correctly round numbers in order to trim to my most significant or my least significant digit. So if you see that number across the bottom of the slide, say it only has three significant digits, how would you round that? I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Thanks for watching, and I hope to talk to you again soon for another topic in astronomy.